Welcome everyone. My name is Haley Buckner and I'm the Professional Relations Manager for Elevate Oral Care. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Before we start, let me cover a few housekeeping items. For those of you remaining online past 50 minutes, your CE certificate will be emailed shortly after the completion of this webinar. So be sure to check your spam folder if you don't initially see it. And you're all muted, so no need to worry about background noise. We will have time at the end for questions, so please submit your questions on your webinar dashboard. We have hosted an extensive series of free live CE webinars on many topics important to providing exceptional patient care. These free webinars are available for self-instruction on our website at elevateoralcare.com slash elevatingcare. Be sure to bookmark this page and return often to see what's new. Also, if you have a webinar topic request, feel free to suggest it by sending an email to info at elevateoralcare.com or by completing the webinar survey that will be sent after the completion of the talk. For tonight's talk, we are honored to have Dr. Melissa Cyber. Dr. Cyber is a dentist practicing in the US Air Force and is in her third year of an AEGD. She is a 2022 award recipient for top 40 under 40 dentists in America and she is the creator and host of the number one dental podcast, Dental Digest. If you haven't already, be sure to check out her podcast. There is a reason she is the number one dental podcast. She's doing amazing things. But Dr. Cyber, I'll let you take it away from here. Hey, Haley, thank you so much. Are you guys hearing me okay? Everything's Sounds good? Sounds great. Okay, awesome. Hey, you guys, so it is such a pleasure. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about, and it's really ending the tooth death cycle. So I just want to start by saying that while I am so proud to be operating in the Air Force, nothing that I'm presenting today is intended to be reflective or endorsed by the U.S. Air Force. Um, I'm not operating tonight as Captain Cyber, but I'm operating completely independently. And so I do want to be forthright about some of my conflicts of interest. Um, I'm a KOL for many of these companies, if not have a relationship with them. And so just a little bit about me, uh, exactly like Haley said. So I went to the Air Force Academy for undergrad, then University of Louisville for dental school. Um, and then I've really had the distinct pleasure of having a really extensive education, three years of a postgraduate AGD. Um, as Haley said, the award recipient for the top 40 under 40 dentists in America for 2022. And the Dental Digest podcast has won um, most educational podcasts in dentistry two years in a row. And I have a phenomenal spouse. He is super supportive. And without him, I don't know if I'd be here today with you guys. So what I want to talk to you about, I want to talk about what the tooth death cycle actually is, because I think oftentimes patients might mistake um, really its importance and why we want to be so careful about conserving tooth structure. I'm then going to talk about the medical versus surgical model of dentistry, and I'm going to talk about the tools for prevention that we have available. There's going to be a little bit of trivia as we go. Um, I would love to have the option to be able to see your responses, but I don't think that's possible. But I want you to keep track of what you respond. So I want to show you this tooth right here. It's a D1 lesion. And I want to ask you, is this a tooth that you would treat? So take just two seconds, ask yourself, is this something you would treat? And so I'm going to show you the exact same lesion. And now here it is one decade later. And so, as you've noticed, it really hasn't progressed. And so, this is what's really important. The question I asked you, would you treat this, that wasn't really a fair question because there's a lot of considerations we want to take into account. We don't just want to always look at these lesions on the radiograph and make a decision, but we want to make informed decisions where we're taking historical radiographs to see, is the caries progressing? We know that with the classic Pitts and Rimmer study, and again, there are other studies out there, but let's just use this kind of as a bit of a guidepost. With the classic Pitts and Rimmer study, about 40% of the time, these D1 lesions are in fact cavitated, but that means that 60% of the time, they're not. So this means that we're over treating these teeth. And so I want to begin by showing you this because as we go along, I'm going to also provide you with preventative adjuncts that perhaps we can use to treat these teeth. But when you look at a case like this, you want to be asking yourself variables such as, does this patient have access to fluoride? Um, am I going to see them for routine dental care? What is their diet like? Um, is this someone that is going to be receptive to instruction? And then, of course, you want to correlate your findings on radiographs with clinical findings. But so, in effect, it's not enough to just show you a lesion and ask you if you're going to treat it. 
And by the way, how was I able to follow this patient for 10 years? This is actually my mouth. And so we know that nothing's better than nature. Our restorative materials, we have made leaps and bounds with these materials, but yet nothing that we have restoratively is going to compare to natural tooth structure. We know that enamel is the hardest structure in the body, and yet dentin, as hard as it is, it has this remarkable capacity to be very flexible. And so we don't have a restorative material that's able to emulate this relationship where you have a more flexible substrate underneath a strong crystal that's very capable of bonding. And then I find the dentin enamel complex or dentin enamel junction so fascinating. It's about 200 microns thick, and it enables the bonding effectively of two entirely different substrates, enamel and dentin. And in adhesive dentistry, we're trying to emulate this. But yet our best attempts will never come close to what exists in nature. And so, you know, we know that there's collagen tendrils that are going to traverse the dentin, and this is what facilitates crack deflection. We have materials out there that are capable of crack deflection, such as zirconia. It's capable of transformation toughening, but not quite the way that a natural tooth is. And so keep this in mind that this is only a small snapshot. We could provide an entire lecture of this, but nothing's better than the real thing. And so we have to first talk about caries detection first before we even get to talk about treatment. Because if you can accurately detect these lesions, you can really determine how you can prevent them or respond to them appropriately. And so proper caries detection is vital. I think that when I see people just driving an explore into a tooth, that's, that's not really accurate. You wanna begin by having magnification because you can see these lesions here. Some of them you can spot as a false positive and some of these are real lesions. But it's important that we thoroughly dry the tooth structure because when it's thoroughly dry, we can be more reliant on the optical, optical properties of carious tooth structure. I always say we want to have sharp eyes, but a dull explorer. And tactile evaluation can lead to false positives, especially because we know as you get deeper into the dentin, you get more wet, or you get more uh, tubules and they get wider. This can lead to false positives because it's softer. And so we want to be looking for um, enamel with a bluish brownish hue, and then we're looking for opacity in the enamel. And so in effect, we have systematic reviews that tell us that visual evaluation alone is effective enough for proper caries detection. So let's talk about the tooth death cycle and what is this? And I'm going to start by telling you this is really the process that gets underway as soon as we pick up a hand piece to a tooth. And this is why we want to know what we actually need to remove and we want to know what we can save. So to begin, let's say that you took that radiograph I showed you earlier and you did decide to go ahead and prepare the tooth. Well, we know that this is going to come at a cost. So in effect, Enamel is actually a compression dome, and you can think of this a lot like a tin can. If I were to give you a tin can, no matter really how strong you are, if I were to tell you to compress that tin can as hard as you can, it would be challenging for just about anyone here. But when you go ahead and take the top off of that tin can, and then you try to compress it, it takes almost no effort at all. And you can think of enamel functions quite the same way as this compression dome. Once we go into the tooth structure and we prepare it, the tooth is much more readily, it's going to much more readily collapse under loads. And so, and that's the other thing to remember too, teeth have all these microstructures that's going to facilitate uniform load distribution. And once we take away tooth structure, we lose that ability. And so just to illustrate the power of compression domes, you can look this up, but they actually did a demonstration where they drove a car on top of inverted teacups. And so, with these inverted teacups, they were able to withstand just one under each tile. They were able to withstand the load of the car. And so let's say that you then decide to restore this tooth. We know that even the best place restorations fail. I have immense respect for my colleagues out there, but I, I do think that there's this notion out there that a restoration is only supposed to last two to three years and then you can go ahead and replace it. But really, they're intended to last considerably more, considerably longer than that. And it's much more technique sensitive. You know, you have to be asking yourself, are you utilizing proper, um, are you utilizing proper um, isolation? Are you following the manufacturer's instructions? These restorations are incredibly technique sensitive. 
And even with the best bonding agents we have available, such as 10-MDP, we know that eventually it's going to succumb to hydrolytic degradation because oftentimes we're bonding on a humid substrate such as dentin. And so um, we know that even the best laid plans might fail. So first of all, we want to be mindful about the consequences of restoring these teeth. And so then we know, okay, we have all been in that situation where we've extensively prepared a tooth, and then eventually now we're moving on to a crown. And just like we talked about with enamel being this compression dome, once we prepare the tooth for a crown, now we're taking away substantial axial wall height. So now the tooth's becoming even weaker, even less capable of withstanding a load. And you might want to be more conservative. You might be thinking about doing an overlay or an onlay. That's oftentimes my go-to. But even then, we're removing cusps. And then so oftentimes, we've prepared this tooth for a crown. We have evidence out there that about a third of these cases, they're going to result in a root canal. Not all. Um, we're getting better and better, but it's not uncommon. And so there's a lot of reasons that a root canal can eventually fail. You could have catastrophic root fracture. You could have a crack going down the tooth. You could have missed a canal. Um, and so these root canals are substantial. They can last an extended period of time, but they're, they're not perhaps perfect. And so eventually the patient might then lose the tooth. And so we wanna be preserving natural tooth structure at all costs. You can see how we started with a simple restoration that you were questioning whether or not you needed to restore it. And now we've wound up at endo. And then even worse, now we're thinking about an implant. Implants have a phenomenal survival rate. Um, you know, in instances of five years, it's about 94%. Beyond 10 years, it's 86%. But even then, we've seen these fail. And they can succumb to periodontal disease and caries. And that's a, that's an important, the implant itself is not necessarily going to succumb to, peri, or to um, caries, of course. The adjacent teeth might. And in a second, I'll talk about why. But periimplantitis is not a self-limiting disease. Implants don't have the supportive tooth stru the supportive structure that natural teeth do. And so it can get bad and it gets bad very quickly. And especially too, oftentimes I know you have all seen these cases where we see a considerable amount of bone receding by the implant. So nothing's gonna retain bone better than a natural tooth either. And so can implant contacts change? I want you to ask yourself, I'll give you about two or three seconds just to ask. So the answer is yes, they can definitely change. The skeletal complex is gonna to continue to remodel throughout a patient's lifetime, but yet that implant is gonna stay in that place. So then this can lead to contacts opening. And this is what I was talking about with, in a high risk caries patient, you wanna be thinking, you wanna be considering their caries risk status in your treatment plan for an implant, because now the contacts are gonna change and then ultimately, if the patient has poor oral hygiene or difficult keeping them clean, then the adjacent tooth, um, in this case, we can see it can become grossly carious. And so when you're treatment planning in these cases, you want to be evaluating periodontal disease, of course, but also carries risk. And so individuals that are high carries risk, they might benefit from a screw retained implant um, and Essex to help maintain those contacts. This is something that you want to be talking about with your patients in advance. And so we know that the hydroxyapatite in the tooth, it's going to be carbonate substituted hydroxyapatite. This is the main component of dentin and enamel. However, when teeth are treated with fluoride, fluoride substitution is going to occur. And it predominantly occurs on the outside surface of the enamel. And so I'm guessing many of you have seen what I call a fluoride bomb, where the caries on the outside surface, it's very conservative, but then all of a sudden, as you get into the tooth, you see this gross caries. And this is from the fluoride, the fluoride substitution on the outer surface. And then as we go on into the tooth, we can see carbonate substitution on the outer surface. So really, our best bet is to prevent caries and keep patients healthy right from the beginning. Because when things go bad, they go bad quickly. And so the deeper the caries process penetrates into the tooth, the more soluble the appetite becomes. And so this is, this is what I want to ask you. Has dentistry really evolved? 
this is a photo of a 1400 year old tooth and you can see here they're approaching it perhaps the same way we do today where we see gross caries and we just excavate it and so are we thinking about dentistry any differently is all that we're focusing on are we really just focusing on managing the outcome rather than the disease itself you know, are we applying the surgical model to dentistry as opposed to the medical model? Are we thinking as surgeons or internists? And you can kind of see throughout medicine as we get, as technology improves, um, as modern medicine improves, we try to become more and more conservative and we try to be thinking, how can we manage these on a disease spectrum? So take, for example, asthma. Asthma is a disease spectrum. You can have very well controlled, you can have very poorly controlled. Based on how poorly controlled it's gonna be, that's gonna dictate the types of medications they're taking. And you can see this all throughout medicine. Um, you can see the way that based on the severity of the cancer, this is gonna dictate the radiation dosing and the treatment. And so I think it's problematic sometimes in dentistry, we oftentimes just approach this with our surgical brains where we see the decay and we're gonna remove it. Um, but this really isn't setting the patient up for any more success. This is gonna have them coming back year after year and they're gonna kind of have it in their mind that really ultimately their relationship with you is that you're gonna remove the disease and they're gonna just keep on coming back. But as we previously talked about, that's why it's so problematic. We start with a small lesion and it continues to progress and get worse until we ultimately lose teeth. So it's really all about prevention for attention. And sorry for the corny little pithy thing, but it's what I believe. I think patients are living longer and they want to keep their teeth and they're counting on us to help them. Um, I think patients no longer really are amenable to a removable option. They're seeking a fixed option. Oftentimes I think the removable options, that's at the late stage in the game where we've exhausted all possibilities for a fixed option. But when patients have lost too many teeth, um, we don't have those abutments, then that's really what we have left. And I think I see some of the busiest practices with the highest volumes of patients are the ones where they've built up patient trust because the patients know that the dentist is there to help them to keep their dentition throughout their life. And so it's really all gonna prevent, begin with prevention. And so let's think of this with the medical model for caries management. The way I talk to my patients is that I talk to them about caries is the disease spectrum because oftentimes we think of just a cavity it's either absolute you either have it or you don't but i talk to patients as it's a whole disease spectrum where on one of the end you can have this very incipient lesion an e1 e2 lesion maybe even a lesion that you saw at the beginning and then on the other end you can have these large lesions where you know they're quote unquote bombed out to you um, it's questionable if I can either salvage this tooth. And so I explained to them, there's a whole disease spectrum here and it's 90% you, 10% me. If you can follow these instructions um, and really take ownership, I think we can really get on the good track. But if the mindset's gonna be that I'm ultimately responsible and you're gonna keep coming back to me, we're not gonna make progress. And I do think that in dentistry, we're really celebrating all these innovations, you know, the ability to have uh, technology such as Invisalign, where, um, where we can really enable our patients to get good orthodontic treatment on their terms. In aesthetic dentistry, all of these big innovations have come about, if you think about it, because the groundwork was laid for prevention. I think sometimes prevention isn't always as sexy, and it's kind of like the COVID-19 pandemic, where um, everyone kind of followed the instructions, we all bunkered down, and then COVID wasn't nearly perhaps as severe as it could have been, but no one was really celebrating that. And I, I think prevention can be a bit of the same way where uh, patients aren't always getting excited. Dentistry isn't, we're not always getting as excited, but this is what undergirds our whole foundation to enable to do us the dentistry that we want to do. And so, Ask yourself this, what does CAMBRA stand for? Take two or three seconds, try to see if you know it. So CAMBRA stands for Caries Management by Risk Assessment. And just like we talked about, caries is a disease process and it's a whole spectrum. 
Canberra enables us to find appropriate treatment adjuncts for our patients based on the severity of their caries. And not only that, but this enables us to stage and grade really just how severe the disease process is. I can tell you that these patients I manage very differently based on how severe their caries is. So again, we're looking back, let's think back to that case I showed you at the beginning where the lesion was decently small. However, if they had several lesions like this, they had a high caries risk, I'm gonna approach this tooth very differently. So if you'll notice, I never really gave you a straight answer, yes, you should treat this tooth or no, you shouldn't. But what I am gonna give with you is adjuncts for consideration. And so the American Dental Association considers the CAMBER model the gold standard for caries management. And you can get printouts like this on your website. I've seen some practices be very successful where they take these printouts and then they rewrite them so that um, it's on terms patients can understand. So for example, things like unusual tooth morphology, putting them at risk. They instead say things like, I have deep pits in my teeth. I have um, deep grooves in my teeth. And they're actually giving the patients these printouts before the patient's even seated in the chair. And the patient can actually circle which of these apply to them. So the patient can already begin to gauge how severe their caries risk is. So they might be more open and receptive to the treatment adjuncts and instruction that you might provide them. And you really get buy-in. But this is also really useful to you because now you can determine how you want to treat these patients. I'll tell you that with my high risk patients or extreme risk patients, I'm having them come back for the application of fluoride varnish on about a three to four month basis. And again, also, there's important considerations in here that you might not have thought about. So, you know, of course, perhaps fluoride exposure, that's more mainstream, but things like having a um, removable pro or a removable Essex retainer, so perhaps they're in um, clear liner therapy, these variables are gonna put them at higher risk. Also, be talking about your patients with the medications that they're using. You might not notice that they have reduced salivary flow at that appointment. Um, however, by going over the medication risk, you can screen these patients and also treat them differently. And so I also talk to my patients about, hey, caries is a disease of acid attack. It's not only going to be uh, the byproduct that the bacteria is producing from a diet high in refined carbohydrates, but also if they're consuming um, an excess of acid throughout the day, this is also going to lead to demineralization. And so, you know, I explain to patients that if they're consuming these things that are going to have a low pH uh, your mouth is going to want to buffer this, it's going to release minerals, it's going to cause demineralization. And so I explain that so they can understand why it's so important to not be consuming fine carbohydrates all throughout the day. I also say that if you're going to have some, um, if you're going to have refined carbohydrates or uh, something that's quite acidic, that you want to be sure to be buffering with water. And so this is what it comes down to, a pound of prevention. So let's first talk about fluoride varnish. So we have systematic reviews and meta-analysis that now support its use. Um, when patients are concerned about it, uh, oftentimes what they express is that they're afraid of what it might do to their brain, but I reassure them um, that we have an abundance of evidence that it's safe, and also it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, it, we really don't have any sort of known mechanism for how it could uh, damage a person's brain. Um, and it's, it's also effective at arresting enamel lesions. But when it comes to fluoride gels, uh, I would say that fluoride gels are becoming a bit more antiquated. We're moving more toward fluoride varnish. We just have better evidence that it's more effective. And so one thing to keep in mind is to read your manufacturer's instructions for the varnishes. If you ever have a question about manufacturing instructions, you can easily Google it. So just type in this specific product and it's gonna spell out how to use it. Some are going to be more hydrophobic and some are more hydrophilic. For those hydrophobic ones, you want to be sure that the tooth structure is dried. Um, you can floss in approximately after you place this varnish. However, we don't have strong evidence that it's going to be very strong in arresting these interproximal lesions. But I'll also say that you really do have nothing to lose by doing it, and it's only going to take a few seconds. Um, so oftentimes, too, it can be difficult to convince patients of fluoride varnish because after they have had a propy, their teeth feel so great. So, and I, I want it to be a really positive experience for them. So these high care risk patients where I know I'm going to see them again after the propy, I might hold off on applying the fluoride varnish. 
And so also with my high carriers risk patients, I'm having them come back about every three to four months to apply it. And so here's another question. Is fluoride varnish, is it FDA approved for carriers prevention? So the answer is it's actually not originally FDA approved for carries prevention, it's actually FDA approved for hypersensitivity. But throughout medicine and dentistry, we use medication off label all the time. So for example, I have patients with chronic pain, I'm managing patients with trigeminal neuralgia, and one of my first line go-to drugs is actually to give them an SSRI or a muscle relaxer actually. Or take for example, patients with burning mouth syndrome, they're often prescribed a tricyclic antidepressant. Um, just be sure that really with anything that you're using, if you're using it off-label, just be sure that you have it documented for its use. But again, I, I don't really actually know very many providers that are using fluoride varnish for hypersensitivity. I think the go-to default is for caries management. Uh, and just like I talked about, use it at three to six month intervals. And based on when you can determine your patient's caries risk, that's going to determine how often you want to apply it. And so what about silver diamine fluoride? This is a hot topic that I love to talk about. It's only been recent that it's come to the States and that's why clinicians I think are still trying to understand its utilization. It's very basic and it's colorless. So in this photo, you can actually see at the bottom, there's a little bit of silver diamine fluoride that's not water. That's what it looks like before it's applied. And it can be used in children and adults. I will tell you now that I use it more often actually in my high carriage risk population for adults. Um, of course, it's great for children and the pediatric population, uh, particularly for arresting caries to improve cooperation. Um, oftentimes I will have kids that they will not tolerate a restoration, but they have rampant caries. And so our go-to is to apply silver diamine fluoride. And so it's gonna function as an antimicrobial while the fluoride promotes remineralization. And so just like fluoride varnish, it's actually FDA cleared for sensitivity. But again, I don't really know any dentists that use it for sensitivity. It's used to really arrest caries. It's going to stop the progression and outright arrest caries without removing tooth structure. And yes, but I hope just we... like fluoride varnish, it's being used off label for caries management. You know, originally FDA cleared for sensitivity. And so yeah, how, how do you apply this stuff? Because it's newer, there are misconceptions out there about how it's applied. I can tell you it's very easy and very user-friendly. And so you actually just use a micro brush to apply it. Go ahead and dispense a drop and then use your micro brush to apply it on the affected areas. And so how often are you supposed to apply it? The ADA convened an expert panel in 2018 where they recommend that it's applied twice a year. But again, this is kind of gonna depend on your patient's caries risk. And so one of the things that I do in my practice is that I get informed consent before I apply it. Um, I talk to them about how this isn't going, they're still gonna need a restoration. It's going to cause staining um, on the disease carries tooth structure um, and that the staining is permanent. And so I apply Vaseline on the lips and I'm also very conscientious of clothing, um, this will stain. And so it's also going to stain surfaces. And how do I know this? Because I have mistakenly stained countertops with SDF. And one other thing to forewarn your patients about is the ammonia compound. It has an absolutely horrible taste. I've tasted it myself. And so this is why oftentimes toddlers and young children are going to cry. Adults don't like it either. One thing I've heard a colleague do that you can consider is using an isovac, um, an isolate, when you apply it. My concern might be that you could lose some of the SDF, um, but one of the benefits is that they can forgo some of the horrible taste. So does it cause staining? Well, of course, we've talked about, yes, it causes staining to the diseased tooth structure, um, but it's not going to stain intact tooth structure. So no worries there. The question is, are all of my teeth gonna turn black? No, it's gonna be the disease tooth structure. And so um, it stains, also stains hypomineralized and immature enamel. And so the reason for this is that the porous enamel allows silver to penetrate through the tooth structure. 
but just like we talked about, it doesn't reinforce the tooth structurally, so you want to be thinking about final restoration on these teeth. And most, most of what we know about SCF does come from primary teeth, but of course that's not to say that we can't use it on adults. One population that it really shines in is in the geriatric population. Uh, it actually has a success rate of 72% higher than placebo for these root caries. I can say some patients might be so medically compromised that they can't tolerate treatment um, or perhaps are too dental or unwilling to um, on these root caries. And so this is a great adjunct to keep in mind. And so I have a case right here where I did, this is a case where there's rampant caries. I know it's gonna be a while until this gentleman can come in. He drives from very far away. Um, and also, as you can see on some of those teeth, we're starting to get near the gingiva. And I know that's gonna be more difficult restoration and restore. And so really in one of our first initial appointments, I applied SDF throughout these lesions. I really like it because I can feel that even though I can't see him for a while, we can at least make some headway on arresting his lesions. But also I have to tell you that when I then went to restore these cases, um, I'm, I'm really inclined to believe that the caries was considerably much more easy to manage um, because it does arrest the caries. And so I felt that I wasn't spending as much time excavating lesions. And also, just like we talked about, in those cases where it's close to the gingiva, I know that's gonna be difficult to restore. Um, and so I'd like to arrest it right here and now so that when it comes time to actually go there and restore it, um, I'm not having I'm not having to chase as much tooth structure under the gingiva. And so here's a really fun phenomenon um, that SDF is responsible for. And believe it or not, this is not a term I made up, the zombie effect. I think actually I, I think it should be called the cannibal effect, and you'll see why in a second. Um, but this is something SDF is known for and increases its potency. So in effect, here's what's happening. The cariogenic bacteria is gonna adjust the silver diamond fluoride and then it dies. And then the next bacteria is gonna then go eat the dead bacteria. And then the silver diamond fluoride within the dead bacteria kills that next bacteria. And so hence the reason you can see why I think it should be called the cannibal effect. And so here's a study, here's an example where someone is indeed using the zombie in fact, just in case you need a proof I didn't make it up. And so I, I think silver diamond fluoride is really revolutionizing adult dentistry and pediatric dentistry. Um, there's no way that I can talk about all of it tonight in this webinar. So here's a handy dandy QR code. Elevate is great about providing more information. So go ahead and check them out. And so can you restore these teeth that have had silver diamine fluoride placed? Can you actually bond to it? Because we know that in modern dentistry, we're much more dependent on our bond. Um, we're not quite utilizing mechanical retention the way we once were. We're much more dependent on the bond. And so we need to know in cases where there's rampant carriers, we're restoring these, um, is SDF gonna impair bond strength? And so, just like we've talked about, these teeth are structurally compromised. So can it be done? The answer is indeed, yes, it can. But I'll talk about perhaps the best protocols for bonding, what we do and we don't know. So Barros et al. 2018 and Ali Reza Sadr's group and the University of Washington, they sought to evaluate this. Um, one thing to keep in mind as well is this is a lab study. And so really when we're looking at the hierarchy of evidence and the things that we want to be using um, to help us to really determine our treatment. We want to be using systematic reviews of meta-analysis and if not clinical trials. This is a lab study, um, but this lays a great foundation. So they took four different control groups. In the first control group, they applied silver diamond fluoride according to the manufacturer's instructions, and then they just gently air dried it for five seconds and went ahead and restored the tooth. In the second group, they did the exact same thing. They applied silver diamine fluoride, but then they rinsed it for 15 seconds, um, dried it, and then went ahead and placed the restoration. Now in the third group, this is what's novel. They placed the SDF, um, and then they stored it in water for 24 hours uh, at the same temperature that would emulate the mouth. So if you think about it there effectively, this is supposed to emulate, they're applying the SDF, and then they're sending the patient on their way. And then they have the tooth come back, the patient come back, 
after 24 hours, they then are polishing it with 60 grit sandpaper and they're doing this to emulate air particle abrasion. Uh, so then they briefly rinse the structure and then they go ahead, the tooth structure, and then they go ahead and restore it. And then finally we have our control. There's no SDF, no deionized water. And so what did, what did we find? Uh, so they effectively found, okay, of course, the tooth that has not had SDF, that's going to have the highest bond strength. But then you can see the bars toward the far right, the SDF, where it's placed, and then 24 hours later, they then restore it. These are the teeth actually with the highest bond, or the second highest bond strength. And so this is an important consideration for all you restorative docs out there or people part of restorative dentistry for how to place SDF and then go restore the tooth. Um, we don't have a lot of more substantial studies on this, so this is perhaps a good framework to use. And then, of course, the situation that did the worst was the case where they placed the SDF and they just went ahead and restored the tooth. And so um, Dr. Sauter's lab and Curari graciously uh, provided these images, and you can see that SDF does deposit in the dentin. Um, I can say that dentin is very technique sensitive. It's a sensitive substrate to be bonding to and that's why anytime we're altering it we want to be mindful of how it's affecting our restorations so it can adversely affect bond strength but the big takeaways from this is wait 24 hours after you apply your sdf but we do need more information and so how much fluoride is really in silver diamine fluoride um, well, it's 44,800 parts per million. That's actually twice as much as your varnish. And you might be thinking that this is really remarkable. Why would I even use varnish again? But remember, if we're considering the patient's carries risk status, um, that should be factoring into this. Not every patient is going to need silver diamond fluoride. Um, and especially if they don't have active carries, gross carries, it's not gonna, it's just not necessary. Um, but putting this into consideration, over-the-counter toothpaste has about a thousand parts per million fluoride. So consider that, that is a lot of fluoride. A thousand parts per million as opposed to 44,800 parts per million. And so what about 5,000 parts per million toothpaste that you can get? These are adjuncts that I use also with my high carries risk patients. So um, there's different options available on the market, but this has five times the fluoride than the standard over-the-counter toothpaste. You can use this. I think Stannis fluoride is also a great option. Um, and you might want to be considering, do I want to write them for a prescription or dispense it in the office? I think it can be very helpful to dispense in the office because I think why create friction and barriers for the patient? Um, perhaps this might already be an arduous experience for them, so why not make it easy for them to have access to this? Um, when you're dispensing an office, it guarantees that they get it. You can also make it profitable. You can charge for it um, or just charge them the cost of it or just incorporate that fee into your exam. And so just kind of ending on a few important considerations, we're talking all about ending the tooth death cycle. When it comes to caries excavation, um, one of the things we always want to do anytime I see a large lesion, I'm always doing vitality testing um, because I want to know the diagnosis of the pulp. Are we going to have symptomatic or asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis? Is it necrotic? Is it vital? And so that's going to determine how I'm going to approach caries excavation. Um, I want to have clean margins. We know that we can actually leave behind some caries, but it's important that the margins are clean. Um, I say that you want to be at least a couple millimeters past the dent enamel complex, dent enamel junction for your caries excavation to make sure it's clean. And it's something that you can bond to because we know bond strength decreases when we're trying to bond to caries. An important consideration as well is you can use a stepwise technique or you can use selective caries removal. The evidence shows that a selective caries removal is gonna be more effective than the stepwise technique. And the stepwise technique, you're actually going to go in there, take away some of the caries, place a restoration, come back, remove um, more of the caries, but it's, it's not, I think it's cumbersome and it's not nearly as effective as this uh, selective excavation. So what about xylitol? Um, this is also a great adjunct in those patients. We talked about medications that's going to increase their risk um, for xerostomia. And so these are very common medications. Who doesn't know someone on an SSRI and an histamine or a stimulant? And then, of course, we can have radiation-induced um, 
xerostomia, the patients that are at an extreme risk for caries are the ones where they're high caries risk and then they're xerostomic. That xerostomia is gonna put them over. And so patients that perhaps it's radiation induced xerostomia, their provider's gonna be counseling them on um, sucking on a lozenge all throughout the day to help stimulate saliva. So, uh, you know, sucking on a lemon drop or a Jolly Rancher throughout the day, but we as oral health providers just cringe at this because now you have a patient that's high caries risk um, and then they're extreme caries risk because they're zero stomach and now we're going to add refined carbohydrates and acid into the mix. This just sounds like the perfect storm. So I think that xylitol lozenges um, and gums are an exceptional adjunct in these cases, but just be sure that your patients know which ones they're using. There are some um, over-the-counter you can get that are advertised with xylitol, but if you actually read the label, it has the amount of xylitol is practically negligible. Um, but this can be something that they can use rather than a lemon drop. And so here's a quick question. Is five milligrams milligrams, is that enough to achieve the optimum therapeutic effect? So just take two seconds to ask yourself if that's the correct number. And if you're wise, you're probably Googling this right now. Well, actually, it's not five milligrams, it's five grams that we need to get the therapeutic effect from xylitol. So instruct your patients that um, they're, they can use three to four doses and that they want to be using it for five to 10 minutes at a time. Some of, some of these lozenges, um, you can readily chew up and then swallow, and that's just not going to do anything. They need to have ongoing exposure to it. I've seen um, perhaps improved compliance when they're using the gum because they can chew it and then keep it in their mouth for an extended period of time. But um, that this also goes back to the point of making sure the patients know which products they're using because some of these it's so low that you might have to go through a carton and I mean I'm being a little hyperbolic but almost a carton of trident gum to get this dosage. Um, other products out there um, that can be sold in a dental provider's office they have enough so that with Epic for example you just need about five pieces of it to get that dose. Um, if a patient has an underlying GI condition, you might want to counsel them. These patients are going to be perhaps more adversely affected by them and just talk to them. In some patients, they are more hypersensitive and they're going to have GI adversity. So what about pit and fish resilience? This is also another important innovation in minimally invasive dentistry. It can reduce caries by 58% over four years and 76% in first molars. Um, and there's actually, this is a little bit debated in the restorative community, but there's no findings that it's going to increase bacteria underneath the pit and fissure sealant. It can actually be placed over existing caries, and it lowers the bacteria count because it's entombing the bacteria and it's cutting it off from its food source. And so... If in some instances where you're not able to get good isolation, which anyone here who treats kids can readily attest to this, it's very difficult in those cases. You might have a very limited period of time. So you might wanna be thinking about a glass ionomer, but we really we know that an etch and rinse system is gonna be more effective than a universal adhesive. So uh, you need to be pulling out your etch and using it, using a system um, that involves an etch to get the most out of these sealants. Uh, other adjuncts available that I positively love is resin infiltration. And so we don't quite have time for this question, but just know that in these resin infiltration system cases, you these have to be small lesions, E1, E2, D1 lesions. These can't be on these giant lesions where we know that they're cavitated. I will say though that they are a bit technique sensitive. As you can see here, although they're not prepping the tooth structure, you do have to place a dam. You are placing a hydrophobic resin, so you have to have good isolation. You do have to also drive a wedge between the tooth, which can be quite uncomfortable for the patient, and it's not necessarily faster. So although I think it's incredibly important, there are some downsides to it. In some cases where the patient can't tolerate the wedge, I am having to get them numb. So I wouldn't promise patients that this is a way to um, prevent them from getting a shot. Some patients will always go toward that. Um, but Icon is a proprietary brand. And so in this process, you can see up here, you're putting that between the teeth, you're using an edge, um, and then a primer, and then you're flowing resin into the teeth. One other shortcoming is that radiographically, it's very difficult to see where you've placed the resin. So if the patient ever leaves your practice and it's not well documented, it's 
confusing to detect where the resin was placed. And despite your hard efforts to save the tooth structure, someone might see that, not realize the resin was flown, and then prepare the tooth anyway. So I always tell my patients what I've done for them. Uh, that way they can advocate for themselves in case someone's not aware. Okay, so the important thing to remember about using resin infiltration system is case selection. But we talked about levels of evidence and we do have compelling evidence for this. Uh, there's a 2015 Cochrane review where they evaluate the split mouth design and they determine it's highly effective. So it's important though to have good documentation. So, I'd like to pass this just in the interest of time. Another thing um, is, is electric or manual, is that gonna be more effective? Uh, also, a Cochrane review from 2014 demonstrated that power toothbrushes provide a statistically significant benefit over manual toothbrushes. Um, and so the ideal electric toothbrushes are gonna give the patient sensory or haptic feedback so that they're not using excessive force. And so I always tell patients that brushing your teeth is like washing your car, you want the paint to stay on throughout your life. And so you don't want to, you want the paint to stay on the car throughout the duration of the car's life. So you don't want to be using excessive force. And it's it's the same thing with brushing your teeth. You don't want to apply excessive force. Ultimately, this can lead to non-carry cervical lesions and recession. And so there have been 11 randomized control trials evaluating is oscillating rotating versus sonic action. Is that more effective? Well, these, um, 11 randomized controlled tiles have demonstrated that oscillating rotating technology is more effective for combating gingivitis, whereas the 12 randomized control trials also determined that oscillating rotating technology is better for plaque elimination. And so just in the interest of time, I don't want to spend too much time here, but we have substantial evidence that does suggest that perhaps oscillating rotating technology might be more effective. And so it's more effective for plaque reduction, bleeding site reduction, the likelihood of transitioning to improved gingival health. So what about casein phosphopeptide and amorphous calcium phosphate? Some of you might not even know what I'm talking about. This is kind of, this was a trend for a little while, Dennis using it, and then we found out that it's effective for demineralization, but so is a fluoridated toothpaste. Um, and so we, the patients don't necessarily derive substantial benefit from um, the CPP, ACP type toothpaste. MI Paste is a very popular brand. Um, one thing that is important to recognize for your vegan patients out there, if this is something you're dispensing in their office, it is derived from dairy. And so be sure to be counseling your patients on that. However, this isn't gonna affect patients that are lactose intolerant. And so, you know, I, I see providers distributing this to patients that are in active ortho, um, but I don't, I'm not necessarily convinced that they're gonna receive the same benefits as opposed to using a highly fluoridated toothpaste. So if they are going to use it, it's recommended that they do it immediately um, post-ortho and in high carries risk. And so what am I telling patients about diet? Um, it's really important that if they're going to have sweets, that they're just ingesting it then and there. They're not going to be consuming it all throughout the day. Like we talked about, saliva needs opportunities to buffer. And I'm also counseling patients on being mindful of all the hidden sources of sugar. There are so many foods out there that are marketed as health foods, um, but they have substantial sugar in them. Things like yogurt, granola bars. And also one of the problems as well is inadequate water intake. So they need to be consuming water all throughout the day that gives their saliva the opportunity to buffer. And so, does anyone know right off the top of your heads, just take a second to ask yourself if you know the bacteria that's responsible for caries. So the when there's a diet that's high in refined carbohydrates, um, we know that it can you can have more sharp mutants or lactobacillus being produced. And so your diet is gonna influence the bacterial colony. And then also um, it's going to introduce specific micro uh, microorganisms and rats that have been in a germ-free environment where they weren't fed a high caries diet. Um, they didn't necessarily develop the caries, but then when they did have the germs, they were developing the caries. This is just a classic study. You can look for yourself um, if this is something you're interested in reading. 
And so is it sugar alone? Is it the refined carbohydrates? Not necessarily. It's more complex than that. Uh, starchy snacks, things that are baked, fried, or gelatinized, this can also contribute to caries, um, but it might perhaps be at a slower rate. And so with water, does bottled water have fluoride in it? And so the answer is actually no, because of the reverse osmosis, the reverse osmosis process, um, it's actually going to take out the water. Seltzer water itself, which I'm drinking right now, I positively love it, but it is acidic. And so that's something to counsel your high cures risk patients on. All right, this concludes my presentation. I wanted to give us enough time for questions. So Haley, I will hand it off to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Cyber. That was awesome. So we did have quite a few questions come in. Um, and you mentioned in the beginning about a visual evaluation being enough for caries detection. Do you have any experience or confidence in any caries detection systems? That's a, that is a great question. Um, so I think in many regards, I think that those are perhaps expensive adjuncts that aren't going to do much any better than a trained eye can. And I think, in fact, those can lead to a lot of false positives. So really, just to reiterate, the big things you want to be looking for is you're looking for um, the, a brownish bluish hue uh, the properties of enamel are going to slightly change with caries and so you're looking for those optical changes and that's why it's really important to keep the tooth structure dry when you're looking for caries because you might miss those okay great thank you and another question was how does SDF carry since bacteria responsible are anaerobic are those bacteria able to keep penetrating the tooth mm. you know i I, let me get back to you on that. Um, I haven't come across um, many articles discussing like its mechanism of action and pathophysiology. So let me get back to you on that. Okay, sounds good. Um, what is your routine for SDF application on caries? Once and done, reapplication every six months, or, or what's your routine? Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, and one thing too to note, going back to that SDF question, like we know that the silver is a powerful antimicrobial, and so whether or not the bacteria is anaerobic or aerobic, I don't really think that's going to influence um, because we're thinking of a different process here. I hope that helps. But so what, what is my routine? Okay, so um, of course with these patients I'm identifying if it's indicated and then I'm going to just dispense one drop of the silver diamine fluoride to start with. If there's rampant carries, I might need more. Um, I'm going to use a micro brush to apply it. And then before that, I'm making sure that I'm putting Vaseline around the lips because it can stain skin for an extended period of time. And although you're providing a great service, I think parents might get a little upset if um, their kid leaves the office with a brownish stain on there. And then also, of course, before I'm applying it, I am getting informed consent. I'm having um, either the patient or the parent, if they're under 18, sign for it, just understanding that um, they're still going to need a restoration. It might require more frequent application um, and that it's going to stain dark black the tooth structure. Um, so then, like we talked about, the ADA Community Expert Panel in 2018, where they recommend it be applied by annually. So ideally, I'm having them come back twice a year. But, you know, some patients, it's going to be difficult follow up. So, I mean, I try to have them come back twice a year. Sure. OK, great. Thanks. Uh, the next question that came in was, is there any evidence that placing glass ionomer over the top of SCF has a difference in arresting the, the disease? Um, you know, it's possible. We know that, I, I don't think it's actually been studied. Theoretically, though, like we know that uh, glass ionomer is going to disperse fluoride, um, which is one of its benefits. One thing to keep in mind with glass ionomer is that when it disperses fluoride, that's really only for the first three months, and then it recharges with fluoride, but then that's only going to be for another day. I'd also be mindful of applying glass ionomer in places where there's a high compressive load. Uh, we know that glass ionomer can achieve a really strong bond to natural tooth structure. And so that 2018 study we looked at, that was involved resin composite. But um, I think if you have the opportunity, let's say it's a NCCL or uh, root caries, I think that could be a great restorative material. And perhaps we might even see more success with that. Great. Um, this person asked, um, why do you think dental schools are not teaching comprehensive variable methods for treating disease tooth structure, things such as medical management of caries versus restorative management of decay? You know, I think that's really difficult. And one thing I've come to understand about dental schools is that they are under the gun. So dentistry has evolved so much. 
even in recent years. So once upon a time, 30 years ago, um, you could graduate dental school and really know everything you needed to go into practice, but now it's so advanced. Um, but I just think four years isn't enough. I mean, that's why I've done three years of a post-grad AGD um, personally. And so I think part of it is that dental schools just don't have time. I think schools are improving. They're getting better at teaching it. I also think that, you know, it, it's difficult because there's graduation requirements. I think the schools wouldn't perhaps be as profitable. I, I'm just saying this if perhaps we were just teaching the medical model. Um, I am in a practice situation where money is not necessarily an issue. So I am thinking of the medical model. Sure. Okay. Um, does SDF work on interproximal lesions in the same way as it works on occlusal and smooth surface lesions? Mm. I don't think that there's evidence to suggest it is quite as effective. I think the evidence for that's um, more limited. Like I talked about, you can try flossing between the teeth, but I, I don't think that the, the evidence suggests it's much more effective on the smooth surfaces and occlusal surfaces. Okay, great. And then the last question here was, um, this person said they've heard that using a curing light with SDF can affect the outcome. Is this something that you suggest? It's possible. It's possible that it could be structurally altered um, by any of the heat emitted from there. But that that's really quite theoretical. I haven't really seen that be investigated either way. Um, I can't, like we talked about, we we did see um, in the Barrow study where they were able to restore it, and so they were using a curing light. Um, and so in that study, I don't think that they could exactly determine why the bond strength was decreased. Um, perhaps the curing light factored into it, but I, I don't think we have enough information to know yet. Okay, great. And I lied. There's two other questions that have come in here since. Um, what additional steps can a dry mouth or a Sjogren syndrome patient take to prevent decay? Mm. So those patients, these are someone that I would really carefully follow. These are patients where I would want to be using the silver diamond fluoride um, or a fluoride varnish. They're coming back for more frequent retreats. These are patients that are probably pretty likely to succumb to root caries. So yet another good reason to use SDF. Um, we've talked about xylitol. I would have them drinking um, fluoridated water all throughout the day. I'd also be prescribing them a 500 um, 5,000 parts per milligram, um, just like we talked about the Floramax toothpaste. Um, and, you know, there are fluoridated mouth rinses, but the, flu the fluoride in that, it it's not really high enough, I think, to get a lot of bang for your buck. Okay, great. And then um, this person said that in the beginning, you recommended the dull explorer versus a sharp explorer. Can you elaborate on that and what's the reason behind that? Or is it just to really emphasize that visual exam only? So I, I hope that wasn't misspoken. I said dull, um, dull explorer and sharp eyes. Sorry if there was um, a miscommunication there, but yep, you want to be using a dull explorer and sharp eyes. So you want to be really attuned to the optical properties of caries and what you should be looking for, because there are plenty of times where you can touch an explorer to a spot and it's going to be soft, um, but it's going to give you a false positive. And just like we talked about, um, the tooth structure can change as you're going into the tooth. And so you'll get those false positives. I also think one thing I didn't really talk about is that you can cause the enamel crystal lattice to then collapse if you're pushing too hard. And so now you do have a cavitation. Okay, great, makes sense. All right, well, thank you so much again for a wonderful presentation this evening, Dr. Seibert. And thank you all for joining and spending your evening with us. Um, just a reminder to our guests, your CE certificate will be emailed tonight. So make sure you check your spam folder. And then be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for links to any upcoming free CE events that we'll be having. And then the link that you can see on the screen here gives you access to our, our archived webinars, including this evening's webinar, which should be accessible in just a few weeks. Please share this link with your staff and colleagues. And finally, on our Elevate Oral Care website, you will find buttons to request an informative CE eligible staff meeting for your office. Education on the latest oral health treatments is what we do, and we would be honored to meet with you and your team in person or via the web on a wide range of prevention topics. So again, thank you for joining us. Be sure to check out Dr. Seibert's podcast, The Dental Digest, and have a wonderful rest of the week. We hope to see you all on our next Elevating Care webinar. Awesome. Thank you, Haley. Thank you. Thank you.